Okay, so I'll start by introducing myself. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Shana Lord. I am the Inclusive Club Network Manager at Access Sport and I'll be hosting today's webinar. Um, a little bit of introduction about Access Sport if you aren't already aware. Sorry, Ella, can I just jump forward two slides if that's okay? Thank you. We can skip the photo of me, that's okay. Um, a little introduction about Access Sport if you aren't familiar with us. We're a national charity who believes that no one should be excluded from the transformational benefits of sport. We work with community clubs and coaches across the UK to tackle the barriers faced by underserved children and young people. Clubs that work with us are invited to join our inclusive club network, which is hosting today's webinar, and they can benefit from so many opportunities such as this webinar today and training and other events that we like to host. It's great to see some familiar faces on this call today, and it's great to see some new ones as well. So if you're not in the network, let's tell you a little bit more about it. Um, it was launched in September 2023, and it is a national network of clubs that have been supported by Access Sport, all working towards the same goal of making inclusion the norm. The network is a space to connect with like-minded people, share knowledge, and learn from each other's experiences and celebrate the incredible work being done in community sports across the UK. Up until now, we've hosted multiple webinars like this one, including our Breaking Barriers research, and most recently, our Building Stronger Communities Roadshow, which saw myself and my colleague Kelly travel the UK, hosting in-person events to share that, re that research. And it was great to see so many people from the network in the room. There'll be a QR code at the end of this webinar that if you're not already in the network, you can join, or if you have any questions, I'll pop my email address in the chat box and you can drop me a message. So I don't wanna waste any time because we've got so much to cover today and so many amazing people to hear from. So I'm gonna introduce our first speaker, which is Helen Robotham. Access Sports CEO, as well as sitting on the Paralympics GB board. So I'll hand over to Helen now to tell you more about it. Brilliant. Thank you, Shauna. And it's great to see everybody online and nice to see some familiar faces and names on there as well. Um, as Shauna said, I'm Helen Robotham, Chief Executive of Access Sport. I'm also a board director and trustee at Paralympics GB. So I was really pleased to be able to join this session today. I was also very lucky to be out in Paris for the final weekend of the Paralympics and from the spectacular and full venues to the amazing volunteers it really was just a, an amazing time there was a fantastic atmosphere across the city and as I'm sure you already know Paralympics GB had their most successful games yet bringing home 49 gold 44 silver 31 bronze medals 24 in total, finishing second only to China and head of the US for the third consecutive games, which is just amazing. Uh, my personal highlights um, were definitely the wheelchair basketball final where Paralympics GB took home our, second, our first Paralympic um, wheelchair basketball medal, sadly silver, not gold, but it was very close and uh, it was a tight finish, uh, kept us going all the way to the end. I also actually adored watching the para canoe in which we have loads of amazing athletes. I uh, particularly love watching Emma Wig and Charlotte Henshaw are just amazing characters as well. But of course, back home, the Games created a fantastic buzz about all things power sport and disability inclusive sport. Um, in the lead up to your games, you had um, the Path to Paris programme, focusing on engaging school kids in all things Paris 2024, as that last photo just showed. We then had Channel 4 provide just amazing coverage, topped off with a daily dose of the last leg. Um, and the games really became part of our daily news. And we got to know and feel connected to a host of amazing young athletes, as well as those such as, I've uh, been to multiple games, such as Sarah Story, who have now really become household names. We also heard, uh, as you may have seen, from lots of politicians talking about the need to invest in disability inclusion particularly in school sport, um, which is the focus of Paralympic GB's equal play campaign. So please uh, do like that, look that up if you haven't already. And then of course, um, Paralympic GB also launched their new social impact strategy, which aims to harness the positive power of the Paralympics and Paralympic athletes to deliver real and sustainable change in the lives of disabled people across the UK. And of course, that's all amazing. But the reality is that when we look at the stats, only one in three disabled people feel confident in a sport and activity setting. 
compared to other settings such as at work or in school or college. I believe we've got a couple slides with these stats on them. Um, we also know that the workforce within a sports and physical activity setting are perceived by two in three disabled people as the least considerate when considering their needs. And also disabled people are almost twice as likely as non-disabled people to say that they're unable to find accessible and inclusive activities near them. So it's really against that backdrop that the focus of today's webinar is how we turn that heightened interest in the Paralympics to um, really ensure that disability inclusive sport translates, sorry, that Paralympic inspiration translates into club engagement. So really looking at how we improve access across the board. And more specifically, how we can all work together to help you and your clubs make the most of that Paralympic buzz, getting more young people taking part in the fantastic offers that you have created or in the process of creating. Because the research does show that, despite sometimes negative um, headlines in this space, the Paralympics, we know that they do inspire people to get active. Um, and, you know, they do impact upon people's interest in sports and physical activity. That is officially known as the demonstration effect. There is a proper academic term for it. <laughs> but we also know uh, that searches for activities increase around the games, and I'm sure we'll hear more about that from Baden shortly. Um, but critically, <clears throat> that only translates into increased engagement when accessible and inclusive offers are actually available, no surprise, uh, to meet the needs of people. And then also, of course, people need to be able to find out about them and they need to be easily accessible and awareness to be raised. And often that's not the case. So our job as organizations and clubs that want to support more disabled people to enjoy all the benefits of sport is basically twofold. It's about <coughs> creating inclusive offers, and making sure that people know about them. It sounds simple enough, doesn't it? <laughs> um, but if we dig a little more into those, so in terms of creating inclusive offers, um, well, it's all about creating new or improving existing offers that are physically accessible, inclusive and welcoming of the communities we want to target. So all the people that have been inspired to get active actually have somewhere to go that works for them. And this is where Access Sport is here to help. As many of you will already know from the work that we've done with you, we can help clubs, coaches, volunteers to rethink how you make your offers as inclusive as possible. From the moment someone checks out your website or sees a poster to the experience they have when they turn up at a session, to how they're engaged in the session, how they're made to feel like they belong and are really part of a a supportive community. We can also help provide, I see the slides are just catching up with me, <laughs> not to worry. We can also provide disability and neuro inclusion training, uh, provide small grants to get new activity up and running, and we can be there to provide support and help address any challenges that you're experiencing. So whether you're really just starting from scratch already have an existing offer that you want to further improve, please do get in touch and we can help you uh, with that work. And then, as I said, the second key area really is about making sure people actually know what those activities are. Um, you know, it's often easier said than done. We know it's really hard to raise <clears throat> awareness of activities that you're running. So on that front, uh, Access Sport Team can help you to understand and connect with local Sorry, for some reason it went to mute. Um, so uh, I'm not sure which point it went to mute. So just to say, in terms of what access for what can we really help you with, we can definitely help you to um, really understand and connect with those local special needs schools, disability and community groups. We can also help you to shape any promotional materials such as 
posters, flyers, social media posts. We can even suggest lots of tips and tricks to help build on that Paralympic buzz, such as showcasing the success of local Paralympians in promoting your offers. Um, again, really just to be able to access that support, reach out to your local uh, or your specific um, access support contact, uh, contact, or if you don't have one of those, then please contact Shana, who will be able to uh, link you to one of our team members. But importantly, of course, I'm focusing on the next uh, um, panelist. Uh, we really do strongly encourage everybody to go one step further and use what is a brilliant platform, the Everybody Moves platform, to really supercharge awareness of your work and also benefit from all the additional support that the platform can provide to clubs that are providing inclusive offers. Um, and on that note, I'm going to pass over to Baden, who's going to be able to tell you more about that platform. Thanks, Helen, and thanks for the uh, the great intro there. Lots of uh, lovely memories uh, from the team arriving back at St Pancras, and um, that seemed like a very distant memory, even though it's just over a month ago now. So, uh, yeah, and a fantastic, fantastic opportunity. So, uh, yeah, my name's Baden. I work at Paralympics GB in our social impact and uh, communications team. Uh, I'm primarily focused around the Everybody Moves platform that we're just going to touch on now um, as part of what we're doing. So, um, Ella, I think it's you driving, so I'll just uh, ask for the next slide where appropriate, please. So if we can skip through to the next one. Um, I'm just going to start with a little bit of background because sometimes it can seem a little disjointed of how Paralympics GB transfers through to grassroots participation. And our overall vision at Paralympics GB is that through sport, um, we were trying to inspire a better world for disabled people. And that underpins the 10-year uh, the championing change strategy that launched in 2022. And that's, that's kind of where, uh, for social impact now, Paralympics GB see that growing to almost becoming a half of what we do. Uh, Ella, if we can just go to the next slide, please. And that social impact side um, really kind of encompasses so many different parts of uh, what we're trying to achieve as an organization. So the ambition there is to use the positive power of the Paralympics and the Paralympic athletes uh, to inspire change in attitudes to disability and bring about equality uh, for disabled people in sport, education and society. And our approach will be disabled led and driven. So quite quite a big statement, but one that uh, overarches and underpins quite a lot of what we're looking to do. I can just blitz on to the next slide, please, Ella. Thank you. So I won't bore you too much with strategy, but it's, it is sometimes nice to see what that actually means. So Paralympics GB work in, in three, so always three pillars of whatever we're trying to do. So in social impact, uh, we're looking to help with equitable access to sport, uh, to champion disability inclusion and transform um, the, the understanding really of disability within, within society. So some fairly big goals and again, this is very top line and, and underneath that strategy falls into place everything else that we've got going on. Uh, Ella, can we go to the next slide, please? Thanks. Um, so just three of our programs um, from Social Impact that we run. Uh, so Everybody Moves that we're going to talk about uh, just now that focuses on grassroots and participation within the community. Uh, we've got Get Set that we run in conjunction with Team, B, uh, Team GB. So that's with young people in schools for inclusive PE and resources. And that's where our uh, Equal Play campaign has kind of fallen in just on there. Uh, and Beyond the Podium as well, uh, which is where we offer support for our corporate partners uh, to do a little bit more uh, in that space as well. So if we um, just go on to the next one, just really quickly with the milestones that we've got here. Some of you may be familiar with the original incarnation of Everybody Moves, which was Parasport. So way, way, way back and a long time before I joined uh, Paralympics GB, um, that actually was a talent pathway and how we look to bring uh, participants through into almost that funnel to then go back to NGBs to then ultimately become part of teams that went to games. So in 2018, Toyota came on as the headline sponsor and provided a really massive uptick for that and, and actually saw the program morph into more of what we know it is today. Uh, so that's where the, um, the activity finder functionality came in and we started to add a few more bits in there. Um, you can tell that one of my, my colleagues has done this bit for me, but where we won the Sport Industry Award for Active and Wellbeing, 
that was where we, as a, a program, pivoted as well to include more online content. So just on the back of COVID um, and trying to still keep people active that way. We then launched our lived experience advisory board uh, in 2022. So that was uh, 12 people from the wider disabled community. Six were ex-Paralympic athletes and uh, six from all walks of life. And what we've tried to do is embed um, lived experience and co-production into the heart of the program. And that's something that we're very proud of um, and something that now is underpinning everything that Paralympics GB do. And ultimately that led to Parasport being rebranded as Everybody Moves. So one of the first bits of feedback that came from the lived experience advisory board was we weren't really quite fit for purpose. We didn't really represent grassroots sports. Uh, with para being seen as elite and sport just being linked to sport. So the rebrand to Everybody Moves was undertaken to allow us really to celebrate more so that we could then look at just ways that people could be active that suited them. And, and I think that's a really big move for the program and something that's really helped us uh, with the content that we produce to look at things like just green and blue spaces around the UK and just being out uh, in inclusive ways just in nature all the way through to what we'd consider the traditional sports too. Uh, Ella, if we can just um, blitz on really quickly to that next slide. So for Everybody Moves, our, uh, our kind of overarching goal is to champion inclusion and empower disabled people to become more active. There's a slightly bigger version of this that says at the end of that, in a way that suits the individual. And I think that's really important that we are looking at activity, sport, and ways to move that suit people in, in ways that just genuinely suit them. Uh, can we go to the next slide, please? Thank you. And again, I'm not going to bore you with uh, too much strategy, but underpinning everybody moves are these three areas that we, we want to work on um, and deliver that overall and the overarching social impact strategy. So uh, empowering disabled people to, to be active, um, a collaboration for change. Um, we can't do this on our own, and we're looking to collaborate with amazing organizations, clubs, providers, individuals, basically everybody, uh, to try and bring that to life. Um, and something that we've really built on over the last two years and building communities. Um, so with everything from our Club of the Month network through to our lived experience advisory board, through to different ways that we interact with so many different areas of the sector, uh, just trying to bring all that together. So they're the three areas that the program works on. So um, if we can just go to the next one, thank you. Um, so ultimately what is, everybody moves. We've got all that kind of backlog to it and, and that kind of building. And um, ultimately there is an online platform and activity finder, which is the main bit that we're going to talk about today. But also everybody moves as a, a content and community resource hub. So whether that's uh, content uh, that we're producing in collaboration with other partners, whether that's uh, community um, resources for clubs, whether that's for individuals, and again, working with the, uh, the wider industry to try and bring all that to life. And so really, it's a, it's a program of collaboration, support and education, and more recently as well, advocacy. Uh, it's been very nice to knock on the door of number 10 and ask for a bit of change. So, um, yeah, that's kind of where we're trying to lean on stuff. Uh, and uh, a really good example of that, again, being our Equal Play campaign. So as we talk about the activity finder and, and really what we're talking to, uh, here to talk about today for you guys, um, who, who are we aiming at with that? So as an inclusive activity uh, online finder, um, it's UK wide, so across all the home nations, so England, Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland, uh, we, we encompass the whole lot. While we gear towards all ages um, with our activities that are listed, uh, the, the focus is on adults, um, but we are starting to branch out a little bit more now to, to be more kids focused with that and also bring in functionality that allows people to find those age ranges that they're looking for. Uh, all genders. And really we're looking to reach out to the disabled community and what we consider to be the wider disabled community, uh, not just disabled people, but carers, family members, everybody that would be involved in that. Uh, and also the enablers of activity. So you guys that are here today and everyone else out there delivering fantastic inclusive sessions. Uh, next slide, please. Ella. So we actually polled uh, all of our clubs that we have on the activity finder. And by no means did we think that we'd come top on this. I think that would be slightly arrogant of us. Um, and we were like, well, how do people find out about your sessions? How do they discover it? And, and number one on that was word of mouth, unsurprisingly. One of the strongest, but also one of the hardest ways uh, to get that message out there. 
but that was number one. Um, surprisingly, actually, it came in with number two was club social media. So still showing that within that space, there is the ability to reach new audiences. And then inferred quite happily, I'm glad we didn't drip to top five, but inferred was the Everybody Moves platform and trying to make sure that we're connecting providers with users of the, um, the activity finder to try and link that all together. If we can go to the next slide, please, Alice. thank you. So how does it all work? And normally we think of something like an activity finder is that you list something and then it gets shown. It's a little bit different with Everybody Moves as we um, support and uh, have been very instrumental in steering something called Open Active. So I've done my best here to try and describe what I've had to learn over two years of what that looks like. And, and a really good analogy for this is Booking.com. Booking.com them, themselves don't actually have any hotels, but they pull all of this resource from around the web and then shove it to you within the app. So what happens with Everybody Moves, uh, you can come on and you can create a listing with us. And that then gets ported out here to this sorting hat that I've kind of put in the middle um, with Open Active. We've done a lot of work uh, behind the scenes, working with third parties and bigger players. So your GLLs, your Open Active, um, so your uh, Everyone Actives uh, and other organizations to, to open their data. So it's essentially a flow of information that all comes together in this sorting hat. What we've then got is a company that kind of sifts through all that, um, decides whether you're, you know, Gryffindor or Slytherin. But what happens with that created um, bunch of listings is that we then pull back the listings that were created initially within Everybody Moves, but also from around the web, a whole bunch of extra stuff. So good examples of that like I was saying before, is everyone active where there might be an existing session that's inclusive. That then comes through and is shown on Everybody Moves. So just on our own uh, platform, and also people aren't then reliant on listening with us. Um, it's just coming in from everywhere. So that, that's a really good way to try and bring more awareness for what's already out there. The other bonus of that is as well that if you list with Everybody Moves, that sorting hat then also pushes your listing out to other activity finders across the web. So a couple of examples being Active Essex, Active Beds. Um, you've also got Red January. So that singular listing with us is shown in multiple locations. And that's what I think is kind of fun about this is it doesn't really matter. And hopefully somewhere within all of those activity finders, somebody will find something and somebody will join a session. And that's kind of our hope. So hopefully that wasn't too techy. I've tried to make that as simple as possible. But if we can go to the next slide, please, Ella, on, uh, on the deck. So what does it currently look like for Everybody Moves? So since uh, 2018, when it came into its current incarnation, uh, we've seen 934,000 visitors to the website, which is incredible. Um, when I checked yesterday before pulling this deck together, we had over 40,000 in-person sessions that were showing on the Activity Finder across the whole UK that are taking place in the next four weeks. We also have 626 online sessions taking place in the next four weeks. To give you a rough idea of how much that's grown since games, when we went into Beijing, there were 5,000 sessions showing. So that's an incredible increase in just a short space of time. Um, and something we're really, really proud of for our outreach work with partners and just trying to get more and more people signed up um, so people can find the amazing activities that you do. Uh, next slide, please, if you can. Al. Thank you. Um, one big thing that happened this summer was our tie-in with Channel 4. And never in my wildest dreams would I ever think that that conversation would be taking place. Uh, if we can just go to the next slide, please, Ella. What that actually looks like was a QR code for Everybody Moves being shown during the coverage of the Paralympic Games. And that was then able to drive all of that traffic towards the website to be able to help people discover inclusive ways to be active in their local area or online. Uh, this went out on the last leg. Uh, Adam Hills was very proud that he managed to break the website. Um, and this went out through a variety of uh, different times during the day and of different events. So we're really, really proud of that. And um, yeah, if we go to the next slide, I'll just share a couple of the stats of what that actually looked like. So during games, uh, we had a unique social reach. So this is individual different people of five and a half million, which is massive. 
Um, during games alone, we saw 86,000 unique visitors come to the website, and that saw over 225,000 activity searches with a postcode. That might sound really specific, but that's that's kind of a key part that we needed to know that people were searching. And if we just go on to the next slide, what that's actually enabled us to do is start to build a map of where all of the providers are across the country. So this was taken yesterday and shows where all of the providers with everybody moves, but also with what we're pulling in from the wider open active network. These are all the opportunities that are currently out there across the UK. And um, as we're looking at that, you can see there are some gaps. So that's part of our next work now is to see why are there gaps? How can we fill them? Are clubs like you guys already doing amazing stuff in that space and we just need to get you signed up? The next thing, and I'm really excited about this, if we can go to the next slide, what we were able to do and pull from games was actually a map of every single postcode search that took place during that time. So we can now see a heat map, and I've just pulled Southampton out just because it was the nearest bit when I was doing this yesterday. But this shows all of the postcode locations during games that people searched for something. And we now have that map of the whole of the UK to then be able to look at and work with our partners to say, these are the big areas that people were looking for. Is there enough supply? How can we bring more things to market? How can we make more things inclusive for people to be able to join? So really exciting stuff and maybe more excited about maps than I should be, but I think this is pretty awesome. And the learnings that we're going to take from this are incredible. And we're really looking forward to being able to share that with everyone that's supporting the program. Uh, so yeah, if we can just drift on to the next slide, please. So ultimately, what are the benefits for you guys sat here as clubs as to why you should bother with Everybody Moves? Um, so we are the UK's largest inclusive activity finder. As we showed there, there's 40,000 sessions on there. Um, and really nice ways that people can start to filter through and find the sessions that are more suitable for them. Uh, it's free to list. So we look after all the costs of maintaining the platform and none of that is ever passed on to you guys. We, we don't make money in that way. It's just one of those really humble, nice things where we just do it because we should. And it shouldn't take more than probably about five minutes to list. So we're trying to always improve that. And, you know, I, I'd be lying if I said that there couldn't be updates. Of course there can be. And that's what we're looking to bring through every time. Your listings with us are shown um, across other locations. So as we said before, that pulled out into Open Active and shown on other activity finders. It allows you to tap into new audiences as well as we're doing all of that outreach work. Ultimately, somebody coming and searching their local area, if your activities are there, perfect. They'll be able to find them. And it's a really good opportunity to be part of an ever-evolving program. We're always learning, we're always evolving, and we're always listening to the community of how we can do better. So that's always at the forefront of our mind and trying to bring that all together. So hopefully, uh, if we drift onto the next slide, that should be just a really high level overview of what Everybody Moves is. And I've tried to keep it short and sweet just so that you can ask lots of questions, but also we've got a really good opportunity for panel uh, questions after that as well. Um, so I'm just gonna throw it over to you guys. Um, does anybody have any burning questions about the Everybody Moves program? You can feel free to raise hands or you can pop that in the comments. Uh, both work super well. I can't have done that much of a good job. I'll jump in, Bain, and I've got a question. Um, so a lot of clubs, I can imagine this would be the first time using a platform like this and, and, and listing in this way. The practicalities of it, is there anyone at Everybody Moves or any way that you can support that kind of first step of like, the practical ways of getting yourself on the platform or is that something that there's maybe a tutorial or webinar or something that we could share after this meeting yeah absolutely the, the hope is that it should be fairly straightforward enough that as you come on that would guide you through that process um we're always at the end of an email um so if things aren't quite working as they should and and that does happen we're not perfect um we're always there to help you there's some quirks in the system as well so we have got a couple of bits in there as well to, to try and navigate around those. One is that you can't put your web address in as www. You gotta go HTTPS and then all the bits. So you know that's that's on us to try and evolve that. And someone back in 2018 thought that was a really good way of doing it. So we're always continually trying to provide that. And if there's enough demand, then absolutely we can uh, we can look to put something more substantial together. Um, the hope being that as we come into 2025, there'll be some fairly major updates that will make it a lot more modern and a lot easier to um, to list. But uh, yeah, always at the end of an email, happy to help. 
Uh, I'm not quite sure who went first, uh, but I've got Mark uh, at the top of my screen. So yeah, happy to take your uh, question first. Yeah, thanks. Great presentation. Really, really useful. I, got, I guess it's an observation slash question, really, in, in that um, obviously booking.com, the people who are on there have got a commercial incentive to make sure their information is up to date. One of the things that we found with activity finders and, and for people, my background is mainly tennis is, is and I haven't been on the site recently, but this, the, there's no incentive for that data to be up to it. So we've had negative experiences of people contacting contacting us saying we found this on an activity finder but the session is no longer running um and just wondering what what mechanisms you had in place to make sure that the activity finder especially if you're pulling it from other other sources that you that there's some quality control that those clubs are still having inclusive sessions or the times and dates and phone numbers etc are still up to date that's a fantastic question and like you say an observation and a question kind of rolled into one and it's it's a really prominent one um stale data really isn't it and and there's nothing worse than you've taken all of that time and energy to go and try and find something and it's just not there so there's there's a couple of elements to this um and the first is that all listings now must carry time and date data so when is the session running but also when is the last session so the more astute and, you know, I ran a snowboard school for the best part of 15 years. I would, in that instance, I try and put it as far in the future as I could to save me having to do it. But what we've actually done is start to limit how far in the future someone can put that listing. So if you're putting it until 2030, the chances of it still running at that time is probably quite low. So in the background, we're, we're working um, with our, our sales force integration to then actively get in touch with providers and say your listing's coming to an end um two months time one month time hey it's gone and what actually happens now is as soon as that end date passes it's no longer shown on the activity finder so that's both good and bad um it's bad if we don't have those processes in place to contact you it's good because it means then that you can't just leave things there to go stale when it comes to us actively allowing the listing to go live they're not automated we have to sit there and check them before they go and believe me coming in on a monday morning that's that's quite a job sometimes but that's one additional way that we try to make sure that it's good you know is there enough information in there that i would you know uh, my mum's a wheelchair user and i had a right job trying to find a robotic club if she came in looking do i feel there's enough information there that she'd have everything that she needs when it comes to stuff coming in from elsewhere, the same rule applies of end date. And also what we're doing is we're working quite heavily with the ODI, so the Open Data Institute, who look after Open Active. And we're really trying to influence the sector to be better. So it's, a, it's an incredibly small number of around about 2 or 3% of all the sessions available on Open Data are actually tagged um, specifically to be inclusive or, or disability specific. So we're saying to all of these big providers, that can't be it. Surely it's not. So also as well, that that thing that you're sending us, it could probably be better. You know, how how's that language on there? How's how would somebody then find out about it? So yeah, you're right. And that's some of the stuff that we've got in place to try and help. But also we're certainly not at the end of that journey. And uh, you know, we'd welcome any any steers from you guys on how that could be done better. So um, yeah, hopefully keep watching the space. It should be good now and then we're still striving for great is the other uh, one from there so hopefully that answers that question um gareth good to see you um i knew you're right i'm very well thank you uh we actually ran our everybody moves launch uh with gareth and his colleagues so uh, yeah a, an amazing event that's no longer called eis in sheffield um yeah go for it just a quick one so we've got a disability brochure that's got quite a lot of sessions in it from clubs in sheffield I think some of them are on your on the, on the Everybody Moves website. If we, in terms of that brochure, could we put a link on there to that brochure so people could and just put, I don't, I don't know how we'd word it, but where people could then go and access that and find all those sessions or would it have to be, the clubs would have to go on individually and input all their information, I guess, is the question. Yes, yeah, it's, it's, it's a good one as well. And one that always comes up of, 
how can we, in the easiest, most streamlined way, get all of this information that we may have in, in various different forms? And it is a great magazine um, and, and a really good one that's uh, you know, stood the test of time to, to help people find that. So how do you then get something that is paper based into an electronic world? And we have explored previously ways of doing bulk data upload. So essentially, we would then take a spreadsheet of stuff and, and bring that in through the back end. So back to Mark's question, that's one way that we try and control the quality is to make sure that you couldn't do that without us. The downside of that is there's a fairly significant change that it needs to happen in the system to allow it to happen. Um, so we're just looking at the minute of whether or not that's possible with what's already there or actually do we need to start again, which is incredibly intimidating part of the process to be at. So where, where I'd advise from that, we had British Cycling with their Limitless program did a similar thing. They wanted to put all of their clubs on and we didn't have the bulk upload process for them. So Lindsay and one of her colleagues actually individually uploaded every single one. And I, I was on the other side of that having to approve them. So it is quite a lengthy process, but one that once is done, it's quite easy then to administer those listings. So as a provider or a, as an organization such as yourself, Gareth, with that, there is a choice of, do you take ownership of that data for everybody that you look after and, and do that? That's, yeah. that's quite a few hours worth of work your side. Or do you then push and engage and, and try and lean on clubs to, to sign up themselves? And there you've got them in control of their data, but also it's, it's a little harder to get everybody on board then. So it's, some do slip through the cracks. Um, so there's no right or wrong way. And ultimately, yeah. we'd love to be able to just say, give us a spreadsheet and we've got you. So yeah. that's what we're looking for. No worries. Um, I think there was a couple of questions in the chat. So uh, Mark, just before I come back to you, if I um, if I come through on these. So Alex at Novasport, do clubs have any ability to access some of the data that you collect? How do we know if there's demand in our area, for example? So great question. The One of the best ways for you to know whether or not somebody's come through to your website is actually through your own Google Analytics. So it's quite simple to do, and we're always there as well to help advise on how to do it. You can create track links that you can pop into the Everybody Moves Activity Finder that then as people come through, you can go, we've had X number of visitors from Everybody Moves. When it comes to the data that we collect, the map I showed you, that's the first time we've ever been able to do that. So we're still learning about it, but also how do we engage with our partners? How do we engage with our clubs to then bring that to life? What, what does good look like in that space? And I'd love to hear from you as well. Feel free to either drop something in the chat or drop me an email separately. How would you use that? What, what benefit would that bring to you other than knowing, oh, I got 20 people that searched for an, an activity in the area. What does that tell you? What would you do with that information, I suppose, is where I'd like to understand a bit further. And we certainly don't want to gatekeep it, but we want to make sure it's used collaboratively for a good purpose, for, for some kind of progression within the sector. So hopefully that helps. Um, and the short answer is we're open to it. We're just trying to figure out all of it. And there's a lot to sift through as well with you know the best part of a quarter of a million postcode hits. So that's a lot of dots on a map. So, um, yeah, I look like I'm looking at one of those colorblind tests and seeing all different kinds of patterns. Um, and Alex from yourself again, thanks for popping these in the chat. Do clubs organizations need to seek permission to use the Everybody Moves website logo on your websites for the purpose of advertising or other clubs and activities? Um, we're, we're fairly open to stuff. Again, we, we want to be collaborative. And if it's where there's something on your website that links back to us, then absolutely. Um, just drops the line there's there's an asset pack that's already there and a lot of ngbs already have that link back to everybody moves on on their sites so um yeah lots of different ways and, and just drops the line i'm mark i'm going to come to you for the last one and i, I want to make sure that there's some other great people on here as well that really should have their chance to talk um so yeah mark please so yeah just a follow-up question really around quality control so obviously you're putting these activities up that are saying they're inclusive but that can mean different things to different people and is there any quality control over session sessions going up or if you got any feedback that a session wasn't inclusive would you take any action 
we would always be open to the feedback of whether something was or was not inclusive. And like you say, that that word inclusive means a lot of things to a lot of different people in many different ways. Yeah. If if it's and we, we always try and empower clubs to be honest and, you know, you can't deliver everything for everybody. I mean, you can try, but it is really hard. So just be honest and strong in your provision and just say we can provide for X, Y, Z impairments. We probably can't do this. And and I think that strength is something as a as a sector we, we should really support. It doesn't mean that you failed. It just means that that bit's in progress. So where we try and check um, is when that listing comes through to be approved. And I'll normally go straight on the website and can I find what it is you're telling me is there? And there's been a couple of instances with um, uh, South Essex Gymnastics Club is a great one. Their listings originally came on, and as I went through to check them, I was like, these don't look inclusive at all. And I called them up, and we had a great chat, and they were like, well, they are. And so what we did was then work on the language that was being used to make that a little bit more obvious. And it's an incredible amount of work our side to try and go through all of this, and we, we do our best. Um, that's hopefully just a window into some of what we're doing um, to try and help with that quality control. But also as well, a lot of it does come down to the individual and to the club and yeah. um, trying so to I don't, want, I don't want to dominate, but also following up because I, I do a lot of work in tennis and the impairment specific or the inclusive sessions clearly easy to go up on, on this platform. But we're working a lot with tennis clubs in particular to be inclusive. So all their sessions should be inclusive i um, so if you've got an adult wheelchair user they go if they're a beginner they join an adult beginner session yeah so how do we is there a mechanism through this platform to get that message out if 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 a if a club or venue is truly inclusive rather than running an inclusive session does that make sense yeah and uh, i it's a great question and i'd, I'd almost throw it back and go is the sector ready for it not to be listed as inclusive? Are the people searching these, are they ready for it not to be listed as a disability-specific yep. session or inclusive? And something we saw in snowboarding was the difference between coaching and instructing. And actually, people used coaching as a major search term rather than instructing. What, what are people using? How ultimately does that disabled person find out about your sessions and what makes sense to them? And I would say that throughout everything that we do, we will be led by the community. And that's why the Lived Experience Advisory Board exists. And, and all of these listings and ideas for it and where to bring it forward go through them. So we'll always be led by what works best for the community. Um, whether or not that's what clubs want, I, I think is a different question. Uh, and a very good conversation to have. But I'm I'm very aware that I've drifted a little bit over time and I'm, I'm really sorry to our other colleagues that are on there, but I'm I'm going to shut up for a minute. And Shana, I'm going to hand the power back to you. No. Um, but all questions are good. No, thank you so much, Baden. Um, <clears throat> I'm really sorry. I'm, I just had a message from Tom and Evan, and they've had to jump off the call. They've had um, another thing come up. So I think we can just go straight into a panel discussion with Baden and Helen um, to chat more about kind of how clubs can really use this Paralympic inspiration. So we're going to stop sharing the screen. I'm going to spotlight Helen and Baden and we can go through because I know there's a lot of questions that came in and we can maybe go through a few more of them. There's another Mark that still has his hands up. So I've yeah. been waiting really patiently. So I'm going to let Mark jump in now and ask his question. Well, it's an observation, really, as much as a question. So I'm in a sport where you can't just have anybody turn up and they can take part in a sport willy-nilly, uh, rowing, so it's on the water. So there's, a, and a, there's always going to be an element of talking to person first, finding out what their circumstances are, taking them in in a, in a responsible way. And I found that the... the uh, activity fighter doesn't really work for that kind of scenario so that's an observation and then the other bit that i that i'm interested in because it's something that i'm trying to do within rowing is what research is it that the what research is being done to find out when people inquire fire fire everybody moved activity finder what is the 
how do you get information back to see that that person is actually getting something at the end of the day or is it they're getting that far and then they're not actually getting to a session what unless we complete that circle it seems to me you know we're not really necessarily get getting bums on seats as it were really good questions and uh, good to good to hear from you yeah mark um helen do you want me to jump in on some of that okay. yeah the hardest part and when i originally joined paralympics gb two years ago um was to take it on the chin that that circle wasn't complete and and it's really hard to do without a booking system and that then comes into a whole world of complexity as well so back in snowboard days every single season we'd have a new um you know kind of come ski with me ski bro all those kind of things where it was uh, a, a lesson finder linked in with somebody else's idea of what a booking system should be the trouble is there that it, it enforces a booking system on clubs and i don't feel that that's right yeah, there's that's many ways saying. that activities can be attended and signed up to and yeah the the only way to truly do that would be like say the booking.com uh kind of model where that's there but there is no one size fits all and if you're a club that's just breaking even on your sessions and all of a sudden we're coming in to say if you want to be on this you've got to have this booking system that costs you 400 pounds a year that's not where we want to be no no i'm, I'm not thinking about i think i'm I, to me it's almost much more simpler encouraging the inquirer to say if you do find something you do utilize it can you just go on to a form on the web on your website and press yes i did it and it might not be oh yeah that person i live in they just have to you know put in their general area or their you know postcode or whatever and yeah that's going to give you if you've got 20 inquiries for that area and you get two or three back then you've got an idea that something in there has happened or you get the clubs to do the similar thing the provider when there's somebody comes in they've said they've come from your site they just go on a form and press a button yeah there is all of those options and I, I think there's some great ideas that you kind of brought into the mix there the one thing we hold at the heart of everything as well as user experience so if you've already had to do five clicks to find let's say rowing um we don't want there to be a point where we lose people through having to do too many clicks and it's a really delicate balance in the act that if before going to um any of these activities because ultimately if you find something that says here's a list of stuff you click on that if it looks right for you the next thing is that they're contacting you directly as a club which is great we want that to happen we want them to instantly either go to your website and find it or be able to pick the phone up or just drop you an email that's the key part so yeah what that leaves us with and it's not a perfect science in any way shape or form is that we then need to reach out to clubs and say have you had anybody come and we are doing that outreach work currently so we've got our club of the month winners did a survey at the start of the year we've just done a post game survey with all of the clubs that list with us as well to say how many people actually came from everybody moves did anybody come you know like we're we're not arrogant enough to say that everybody came from us that's that's not it and we're just trying to understand that more and yeah it could be better but ultimately, for me, it still needs to not come at the cost of the user experience and helping somebody find an activity as simply as possible. So, yeah, delicate balancing. Yeah. Just very quickly. Um, so what I've tried to do in rowing is get everybody to use one form on the British Rowing website. And in that case, we're building up a, uh, a list of people that have inquired and if you put it in the right way to them, look, if you do get to somewhere, just just send me a note. And then that's the only way we can tell is what we're doing is effective. It's, it's a very labour intensive thing because I try to interview everybody that puts contact in and say, what are your circumstances? What are your transport? What's your condition? How does it affect you? These kind of questions. And then try and introduce them to the club with support for that club if they need it. It's very labour intensive, but it's shown a lot more success and just say go to X. 
Yeah, there's uh, like you say, it's all parts of the same puzzle, really, isn't it? And it's it just depends how we how we structure that to be the most meaningful. Um, and as I said before, definitely part of an evolving journey. And I'd love to be able to sit here and go, here's all the stats, and who knows, next year I might be able to. But they're all great ideas and all stuff that we we definitely take on board. Well, thanks so much for your questions, Mark. Is there anyone else that'd like to jump in and ask a question? If not, I do have a couple kind of pre-submitted ones that I can jump in with. Vicky, go on, go for it. Oh yeah, yeah. Just to uh, go off the back of, I suppose, Alex's question previously. Um, we're, I suppose we're coming off this as a little bit of a different angle. Sorry, I work for British Blind Sport, so obviously NDSO that work across the country. So again, that heat map to me is um a pretty useful data tool um we actually quite struggle to kind of work out where the areas of need are uh, and trying to reach those who need us most so um that would be like extremely useful to understand where those pockets of people are that are actively searching for um activity um but also i know you can kind of go into specific impairments whilst you're filtering through to look for activity is there any way, and this is a massive if, obviously, um, <laughs> once you've got that heat data, can you then filter that down to anyone that's then used a filter of, for us, it would be obviously a visual impairment. So uh, British Blind Sport, love what you do. Um, your current activity finder is open active uh, compatible. So my understanding is that you're you're consuming, but you're not yet outputting into the sorting hat, so to speak. That may have changed. Um, I don't so... think it has, but I'm, that is definitely not my area. That's our comms team, and I have no idea about that detail. So <laughs> don't don't go anywhere near it if you can help it. It's one of those <laughs> that just starts to consume your life. Um, it was really good to be involved in the conversations with you quite early on to try and just link you in with the right people um, as an organization to to get that and and have it future proof, which I think is brilliant. Um, so filtering, yes, um, we already did it. So we do have the data that shows how many people searched with uh, one of the impairment tags or what they searched with in terms of activity tags. What I would say is that it's incredibly low. And the reason for that, I believe, lies within the, the design of the Everybody Moves website more than it does whether people are actually trying to search for it. So while it's indicative, I don't think it's reliable in terms of the filters. Yeah. Um, but again, that's that's something where we're just trying to figure out what this data means. And then how do we come out to all of the amazing organizations and our partners and the providers and the people who have supported us to go, right, what does this next bit of work look like together? Yeah. Cool. Um, perhaps just add to that from our perspective as well, Vicky, we're you know, thinking that data and the mapping is really helpful because we're always looking at where do we focus our efforts around club development and where there are people searching, but it doesn't marry up with the offers we can then target in our club development work. Obviously, those are clubs that aren't currently on Everybody Moves, the ones that we would want to work with. The aim is to get new offers up and running that can then be posted. So it's really helpful from that perspective. And I guess more generally, kind of the reason we are big advocates is that we recognise, and it's been talked about, you know, it's not a perfect system, but um, actually only by us all kind of really investing in and as many organizations as possible putting into it and all the clubs, will it get better? And will we make it the ultimate, you know, the best platform it can be? So I think the challenge at the moment, we have this as well, lots of different booklets and resources that are used in different areas. And sometimes you need that local resource because that word of mouth piece is so important still and the local networks that we run, that, you know, that is that trusted network. But the more that we can tie it into this sort of national uh, database and all the other stuff that comes with it, better. So that's why we're really encouraging clubs we work with to use this as well. It's definitely exciting. And we've obviously seen work quite closely with Ben Quilter, um, obviously from Paralympics GB ourselves. And and just the power of your name helps like NDSOs a lot in terms of Paralympics GB, just getting on top of things to be able to push. Um, so yeah, it's just exciting to what it, it potentially could give us, I suppose. So 
it's just having that in the back of our heads. Absolutely. And like I said before, we're, we're keen to share it. We don't want to sit on that knowledge, but we want to make sure that it's what is it going to bring? How is it going to help? And, you know, a lot of this conversation was about how we leverage what happened in Paris um, to make more meaningful uh, participation figures for, for grassroots. And that's that's the bit that I'm really interested in. Is how do how do we take that glitz and glamour of the games and how do we make it into more people being physically active in a way that suits them? So yeah, great data, lots of projects that can come from it. And yeah, as soon as I've figured out what it all means, we will be knocking on every single person's door. I'm I'm absolutely sure of that. Yeah. I'm just keeping an eye time because oh sorry, does someone one more person want to jump in maybe before I try and close it yeah. so everyone can get away. Yeah. Sorry. <clears throat> Yeah, hi. I'm sorry you can hear me. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I picked up something right at the very beginning. I think you said Paralympic GB was going to do something with schools. And this is one of our particular bugbears. Um, I'm, I run a para-athletic, adaptive athletic and para-athletic program in Yates, which is around Bristol area and around, actually around for the whole of the Southwest. Um, and it's a real problem in two, two levels. One, one is dealing with the sports uh, the local county sports, uh, school sports rather, um, and also the fact that we, we run with a Sport England grant for, for what we do, but we're not allowed to work in schools um, by the nature of the grant. Um, and so you've got to find a way to extract the kids from school and get them to come at other times, which is crazy. We've got six coaches, we've got a sports therapist working within the programme, um, I'm a really, a really thorough program thinking about a whole range of things, not just when the people turn out the track. We're looking at nutrition, we're looking at uh, physio and all the rest of it as well. But it's a real problem engaging um, with the schools in a way that gets them recognised. So, for example, special schools don't naturally affiliate with the English schools' athletics associations. Um, and it's only this year we've managed to push it into um, national regional and national competitions but it's very difficult when i get somebody from cornwall who says oh the local cornish association won't actually accept us and we're going to have to come all the way to bristol to take part so what is paralympics gb going to do about schools yeah well, perhaps if i just jump in quickly uh, and very crunch time uh we obviously have a team in bristol and we yeah, actually yeah, do I, quite I a lot of them. outreach work yeah. with schools so um so yeah. a lot of the clubs we support do outreach work and that is a really good way of making that connection yeah. happen yeah. so yeah. it's definitely worth connecting with our team in bristol who can talk to you a bit more about yeah, on I, a practical I, level how we can help with that no, um, sorry. I, work, I work with them all the time so there's no uh, there's no problem yeah there. amazing but it's, fantastic it's, but this but it's the structures beyond. It's the schools. Yeah, association. I appreciate that. It's, these sorts of things that are problematic, and that's where Paralympics GB should be helping us to persuade people more. I mean, people tell us schools associations say, "Oh, we can't do it. It takes too long to get a wheelchair athlete. Oh, we can't have two wheelchair athletes in the same." Uh, and all this sort of rubbish. Yeah. Yeah. So, well, yeah. that's definitely a conversation for yeah. um, England yeah, athletics sorry, time, as well. But I, I, let's yeah. pick it up offline because I think there's yeah, quite a sure. lot more that can be done around that and. Um, the equal play campaign is going to really drive things that are governmental policy level as well. And there's a lot of resource going into that. Which if we had more time, I'm sure Bader can say, say more about. Uh -huh. But I'm, I'm afraid we're going to have to. I know. Yeah, I'm going to jump you... in. And I think, like I said at the start, I'm going to share everyone's contact emails. And if there's any conversations that people want to carry on, or if you've got another yeah. question you want to ask, do that, Jim. let's yeah. carry this yeah. conversation on. Because I, I know there's probably yeah. more to talk about for sure. Um, just to make sure you've uh, kind of had a response from me, I suppose, just to check out on uh, Channel 4, it's the uh, Equal Play campaign. So that's the movie that came out that spearheaded the policy paper that we've got in. Um, so go check that out, see what you think, and come back to me with your thoughts. More than happy to carry okay. on the conversation and, and make sure that you feel that okay. we're doing enough in that space. Thanks, Baden. Thanks, Baden. Yeah. So, yeah, I think... We've, we're over time already, so I'm going to apologise for that. Thank you, everyone, for being here today. Um, before you go, like I said at the start, if you aren't in the network and want to be part of the network, there's a QR code on the screen. But I will also share that in an email so that there's the um, opportunity to join if you missed that. Thank you so much for everyone uh, who attended today. It's been such a great conversation, and 
I saw everybody moves everywhere during the Paralympics. So it's been <laughs> great to hear more about it and more of the ins and outs of it from Baden. Um, so yeah, thank you so much for coming. Enjoy the rest of your afternoon and you'll be hearing from me soon. Thanks so much, everyone. Thanks everyone. Thanks everyone. Bye.